Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. We're joined by uh, Chief Constable Andy Marsh. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and today we're going to ask a number of questions that you've raised uh, that you want some answers to. And, and as your Police and Crime Commissioner, that's what I'm going to be asking uh, the Chief Constable about. It, the reason why we have these web chats is very much so that uh, you, can, you can understand what's happening within this organisation. And I want to bring transparency and openness into the constabulary. And it is, this is one of the many ways that we can, we can do that. So we're going to be talking about a, a, a number of quite diverse uh, subjects today. So ranging from rural crime, serious violent crime, stop and search and, and vehicle crime. And that's because these are the things that people have raised things that, things that we've, we've, we've read about, and things that are important to our local residents. So let's, let's start, Andy, for, with rural crime. Now, I've been out, and I know you've been out, we, we listen to farmers, residents and businesses about how they want to engage, how they want to work with the, with the constabulary. And I know that in Avon Somerset, we are very fortunate that we have a dedicated rural crime team. And I think that's quite unusual. But I'm also very much aware that we are in a climate of reducing resources. So we published the tipping point to say that resources are decreasing and crime is changing. So how does that reflect about, you know, we have an enormous area in Avon and Somerset of rurality, you know, ranging from the Quantocks, the Mendips, Exmoor, and, you know, and the Somerset levels. So how, do, how can we make sure that there are enough resources tackling this issue? Okay, well, first of all, to, to reiterate your explanation, um, crime impacts on everyone for different reasons. And there, is, there are additional issues in, in rural communities of certain types of crime, um, which rural communities are more vulnerable to. Uh, and certainly farmers are vulnerable to, for instance, um, their, their um, tools, their machines that they rely on for their livelihood, their diesel being stolen in a way that not only disrupts uh, people who, who would be a victim of crime, but it stops their business running as well. Folding on top of that, the additional isolation and the, the fear that that can bring, it does mean that rural crime is a serious business. Uh, however, you, you know um, that we've got 700 fewer officers than we had in 2010, we've made some significant cuts. I'm not about to make some um, excuses to you, I'm about to underline a, a promise and a commitment I made to you when you appointed me in the start of 2016 when I agreed that I would not reduce the number of beat managers and PCSOs. So we've got about 700 and those beat managers and PCSOs are distributed across the whole force and following the, the recent um, police precept decision that's a, a promise that I've been able to underline for another 12 months and I think that policing at that local level is incredibly important. But, nevertheless, the nature of crime over the last eight years has significantly changed. Mm. Much more complicated, much more sensitive crime, for example, sexual offences, domestic abuse, much of which takes place behind closed doors. So we've protected those resources, we've ring-fenced them, we've put them in touch with their communities, we've worked with those rural communities to make sure they understand the issues and respond to them, but it won't succeed unless there is a close partnership. And I would always appeal for those communities, whether it's through Farm Watch, Neighbourhood Watch, um, good, good neighbourliness, um, neighbourliness, um, creating strong communities actually helps us tackle crime. So th th those resources are significantly protected, so. Mm -hmm. And what's the best way to report <coughs> rural crime? Well, we've experimented um, with um, uh, staying in touch with farmers in particular and agricultural workers through text. Okay. Um, so we've tried that. Um, 101 is something that you've pushed me very hard to make sure that we have um, good timeliness. I mean, picking up those calls and reliability, and that, that's something we're proud of the improvements we've made. So 101, um, but you can also contact us on our um, internet, on our website, mm -hmm. and report crime, or you could attend a front office, and we, we've still got a number of front offices that you can attend. Or of course, um, we're a universal 24-7 service, we, we will come to you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's very true, 24-7. So raising, picking up one of the things you mentioned about Farm Watch. So we have Farm Watch, we have Horse Watch, we have Neighbourhood Watch. Yeah. How effective do you think they are? We've got about 7% of our whole population is covered by some form of watch. We'd like to increase that. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're effective in a number of ways. They're effective because they get information from us, like looking for rogue vehicles, watching out for people, they get crime prevention advice. Um, but also we then get information back from them. 
and we need to continue to work hard to make sure we tell them what we did about that information. But, but actually, so those are two benefits, but there is a third one, where communities stick together and what, look after each other, actually criminals find it very difficult to operate. So th th there is anecdotal and some evidence that that sort of um, active citizenship, if we call it that, is effective. So you would encourage more people to, to be part of Neighbourhood Watch, say? Indeed, yeah, indeed. And, and their first port of call of how do we do that would, would be with the local beat manager or the local PCSO. Okay, excellent. Uh, I think you're right. I think where robust communities look after each other, there are lower levels of, of crime. And is there anything that the volunteers and residents can do to prevent rural crime? Well, our, our website is, um, has a great deal of um, information by way of toolkits whether it's around um, safety, um, security, um, property marking, reporting information to us. There is an awful lot that people can do. Mm -hmm. It depends um, how involved they want to get. We, we're also always on the lookout for volunteers to actually come and work with us, um, mm -hmm. maybe helping search through um, advertised property for stolen property that they can see and that we can recover and investigate, um, maybe helping um, arrange meetings, stay in touch with communities, and um, creating electronic newsletters. Right, right through to if there are people out there that would like to actually um, roll up their sleeves and, and work with us, um, we are recruiting for the special constabulary, and um, so that's citizens in, in uniform working side by side um, with officers and police staff, and they make a fantastic contribution um, right across Avon and Somerset. Okay, so if you're listening and you're interested, then have a look at the website because that would obviously be the first stepping stone, but we need people like you, to come and work with the constabulary. Let's move on. Serious violent crime. There hasn't been, uh, there's only a few days where we've not read about that in, in, in our newspapers, uh, about the increase of knife crime, the, the, uh, the sheer uh, horror of the, the, the number of young people who have been stabbed in, in London. We've had the government now who've um, announced their uh, serious violence strategy. How, but I'm, I'm quite sure that this just doesn't happen in London. So how does serious violence impact on us here in, in Avon Somerset? Well, it is uh, it's something that we're concerned about. It's something we monitor and manage on a daily basis. Uh, the, the figures can tell you all sorts of things. There, ha there has been, in recent years, a significant increase in the amount of violence the police are recording. Um, most of that has been domestic abuse and domestic violence, yeah. and I would say a significant part of that is um, the, the trust that victims of domestic abuse are putting in us to report it, uh, and so I would encourage that to continue. We're getting more sexual violence re um, reported, I think, for sim similar reasons. When we specifically look at knife crime in Avon Somerset, the, the figures are pretty stable year to year. But we have had significant increases and changes in criminality that are surrounded by violence. And I'm talking about drug dealing, and particularly this phenomenon of county lines, where um, young men, and it's quite often young black men, um, come from London, and they're sent by organised criminals to establish networks to deal drugs across the country. And this is a significant problem, and we've seen an increase in the use and carriage of, of knives, and an increase in drug dealing. Now, I'll, I'll give you an example, so I've got a picture here. I suspect it won't go very well for the camera, but I'll hold it up in a, in a moment in case. And we've got a kitchen knife, and we've got money, and we've got 60 wraps of Class A drug. These, these were recovered off a 14-year-old child in Bristol just two weeks ago. So that's the sort of criminality that I'm talking about. And I, I am worried about um, a greater livelihood of it's young men mm. carrying knives, causing harm to young men. And I suppose that the more that young people are carrying knives, the more that it encourages other people to carry knives because there's the argument of defence. Um, I, I, I understand that's what um, some people might say about why they carry a knife, um, but I, I have to say I don't, I don't buy it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the last thing I would um, do if I was worried about knife crime would be pick up a knife um, because A, you've got to be prepared to use it and I think there's a good chance it'll be taken off you or used against you by someone else with a knife. So mm -hmm. that, that's not the answer. In terms of what are we doing about it, we have a dedicated schools team um, in Bristol, which, which I will fight um, to protect because I think they're doing valuable work. And we're, we're relaunching and refocusing those 700 officers of PCSOs that, that you've asked me to, to ring fence to protect in local policing 
to make sure that their engagement in schools is, is very clear and knife crime and violence is something that we need to work with other partners to prevent. One of the things that we've also picked up in the newspapers is the uh, argument about that the fact that there are fewer police, that this has led to an increase of knife crime. What do you think about that? Um, it, it is, the answer to this would be what I think so, because actually proving it is, it, 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 I don't believe it's an evidence base, so I can talk to you about my professional judgment and some common sense. Mm -hmm. So we've got 700 fewer police officers than we had in 2010, we've got a massive increase in the amount of complex demand, abuse and vulnerability that we deal with behind closed doors, which means there are, of course, fewer officers on the streets, of, of course there are. And, and actually, this is a problem which, by and large, knife crime is happening on the streets. Only 15% of knife crime that we recorded is domestic abuse, for example. Right. So that doesn't mean it's not a problem in domestic abuse, but it means the main problem is between young men on the streets. If, if there are fewer officers on the streets engaging proactively and using their powers ethically and with sound judgment to try and prevent and detect these offences, or a, a more limited opportunity to engage in prevention, then my professional judgment as Chief Constable is that, that actually it will be a contributing factor. And how, how does it affect that early intervention, that proactivity? Because, you know, what, what we never want Aidan the Somerset Constabulary to be is just a reactive yeah. force. So how do, you know, you, you, you have reducing resources. How do you balance that, you know, early intervention being really important to prevent the crime from happening? So the, um, our policing model um, in the United Kingdom is based on a routinely un unarmed mm -hmm. uh, group of officers and police staff um, that intervene early and take prevention as their, their core activity. Uh, unless we can actually manage our demand and become uh, proactive rather than simply reactive, then we certainly won't be intervening early. Now, some of the things that we're doing um, that will help us do that is, is that we bring feds down neighbourhood policing mm -hmm. and we're focusing them on these issues, including prevention. We are developing with partners the most advanced predictive analytics in the world to help us identify the cohorts of young people and individuals that are vulnerable. And we're working with partners to engage them and prevent them getting involved in crime. We're also in the middle of rolling out a programme of work around digital mobile working, which you've provided the funding for, which will equip our officers to be on the streets much more visible doing their jobs because they won't have to go back to the police station mm -hmm. and complete the paperwork, mm -hmm. so to speak, on the computer. So we're, we're doing an, an awful lot about it and, uh, and still there's much more we need to do, I'm sure. Okay, thank you for that. Let's, let's move on to stop and search. Now, this is an issue that people have raised with me and I have seen it done really well. I have, you know, I have been present when the stop and search has been done proactively, <coughs> grounds and reasons and all, all and, and absolutely done very professionally and done well. But I also know, and we, we, we know, that it can be done not up to that same standard. And when that happens, it brings a lot of mistrust and a reduction of confidence in, in, our, in our local communities. Uh, in fact, it was one of the reasons I set up the Scrutiny of Police Powers panel, in order to look at stop and search, use of tasers, um, and use of force. So, First of all, there are, a lot, there are quite a lot of myths about stop and search. Can you just give, quite briefly, what the powers are and how they're used? So, the, first of all, I think it's really important I recognise the sensitivity of this power. Mm. Um, it, it, it being um, stopped and searched it is an intrusive um, intervention into your life, and we all have um, rights and we, and we all value our, our privacy and our independence. So, it's a power that I would say is essential if we're to deal with knife crime and drugs, um, but it's a power that the public have got every right to expect us to use lawfully, ethically, with sensitivity and courtesy. So um, there are two significant powers that we use for stop search. There's section one of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, which gives us a power to search where there are reasonable grounds to suspect there are um, weapons or stolen goods, or somebody who's going equipped to commit a crime. And then there is a power under section 23 of the Drugs Misuse Act that gives us a power to search people where we suspect they're in possession of unlawful drugs. Mm -hmm. We, we um, conduct about 1,500 stop searches every three months in the force area. So I, I would say that's not very many. That's far fewer than we used to um, conduct. And 25% uh, of those searches are, result in some form of positive outcome. 
um, an arrest, a caution, something's found. So we, we're, um, we're, find, we're finding these, these goods in, in a quarter of cases. Now, um, if, if we consider that the amount of uh, crimes that we've recorded of possession of a bladed instrument have increased from around about 850 in 2012 to over 1500 now, that, that, that and that's in possession, not not. That, that's possession. in possession of a, a bladed article or knife. Could be a screwdriver. Mm -hmm. That 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 actually, um, th those weapons by and large will only be being found as a result of a police officer conducting a stop search because they suspect they have reasonable grounds to suspect. So that, that that's the law about when we're allowed to search when we have reasonable grounds to suspect that somebody is in possession of one of those stolen or prohibited articles. The law then defines. Um, what, how we should conduct that search. Mm -hmm. And, and as, as you said, um, quite appropriately, with members of the community, your scrutiny panel looks at the records of those searches, looks at the body wall video, and comes to a view about whether we're doing our job properly or not. Now, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary last year inspected 200 um, stop search records, and, and they, we had amongst the highest levels, it was, it was over 190 of them, they were fully satisfied, the grants to search. Now, now, actually, you won't be satisfied with that. You would say, well, well come on, Andy, that should be 200. So th this is a really sensitive area, but I think if we are to secure our mission of keeping people safe, it's a power that we must use. And you can assure me that it is never used to show uh, that it's that you know that you would never set a target to police officers because that's another myth, isn't it? That people will say that the chief constable says that we've got to do so many in a, in, in a week. Yeah, to um, no, be, be completely frank with you, so I've, I've been in policing since 1987, and actually back in the 80s, we, we were performance managed around mm -hmm. how many arrests we made, how many detected crimes we had, how many stop search we, we made. And actually, of, of course, there could be a perverse incentive there um, to either falsify the records, um, if you are corrupt, or to conduct in inappropriate stop searches. So that, that used to be what happened, but that, that in, my, in my personal experience, back in the 80s, maybe early 90s, I absolutely categorically um, can confirm now that, that there are absolutely no targets for stop search. We should only be conducting those powers um, when the grants exist. And, um, the officers have had very, very significant training uh, about this. But, but if you think about it, um, uh, and we do invite people, members of the public, to come on ride along. So mm -hmm. I would say if anyone's listening and they want to ride along, it's on our website how, how you would say I'd like to do that. Policing is complicated, ambiguous, unpredictable, and sometimes dangerous. The, the officers need to be able to act in good faith using their judgment about what reasonable grounds are with fairness and courtesy. But occasionally, of course, that the search won't be positive. And then we hope we hope that if it's done properly, that people walk away saying, Well, well actually that that is the price that I pay. The police are able to intervene, stop and search me if they have grounds, in order to try and stop the knife crime that I've just spoken about. And I, I, I think our, our communities support us mm -hmm. and to do that firmly and fairly. And what do you think the impact has of the fact that officers now use body worn cameras? So the as a mandatory requirement by, by me, something I communicated very um, regularly, um, emphasising the benefits that if police officers um, uh, conduct a stop search, they should switch their body worn video on. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, that there is a, a great opportunity there to throw transparency and visibility over what what we do, and in the vast majority of cases, um, that body worn video reveals police officers doing a, a very difficult job. It's not nice stop searching someone. It's mm -hmm. not nice for them. It's quite a confrontational thing to do. Mm. Um, but in the vast majority of cases, it shows them doing it with uh, great professionalism um, and courage, I, I, I would add, because sometimes people are in, incredibly hostile towards them um, and doing it very fairly. Um, and so I, I, I welcome the scrutiny that your panel sport. Okay. And just before we move off from stop and search, there is uh, the figures suggest about the disproportionality of, of stop and search. Um, how can we tackle that, or what, what analysis can we do in order, to, you know, to, to reduce that disproportionality? Yeah, I, I th this is something that policing and academia have uh, wrung its hands over for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, we we are, are near to um, proportionate levels of stop search in Bristol, which is an ethnic, ethnically diverse community. So we're much nearer in Bristol, um, but but actually, you know, let me give me a shocking figure. 
in Somerset, if you're black from a, a, a minor ethnic group, a visible group, you're 38 more times likely to be stopped. Now, now actually, of course I'm going to ask why, what, what's happening in Somerset? And one of the very pervasive problems that, that we have, and I mentioned it to you earlier, is this county lines drugs problem, mm -hmm. where it is young men, almost predominantly, it's significantly from London, but sometimes from other major cities, will, will, will effectively target a, a rural community. They'll target vulnerable individuals in that rural community. They'll take over their, their flat, their dwelling. Um, they will perhaps give them some money, perhaps um, give them some drugs. Perhaps they'll sexually or physically abuse them. But they will deal drugs in conjunction with the people running them, because in one sense these people are victims yeah. of the organised criminality themselves. And, and they will do it from Yeovil, Taunton. And we've arrested um, well over 100 um, such individuals. It's not a rare phenomenon. There's about 40 such networks operating right now in, in um, Somerset, in the rural areas of the force. Mm. And we're investigating them, we're, we're, we're on them. But, but actually, um, if these young men are significantly from black and minority ethnic groups, and they are, actually who, who could possibly fault my officers for appropriately targeting them to start and search them? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I have to say, I, I think this debate about proportionality, if we want to tackle knife crime, if we want to tackle drugs problems, we have to follow the evidence, we have to follow the law, we have to use reasonable grounds to suspicion. If um, I leave my officers feeling I can't conduct this search because it's not going to look good on, on the proportionality figures, I, I don't think anyone um, would benefit from a police service that made decisions like that. But there, there is a real risk that the officers um, start to become afraid to use their powers because they think they'll be criticised. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that, that is also um, a good reason why they all have body-worn cameras and switch them on because then they can, and we in the police and uh, you know, in, in the panel, they can actually see then what the officer has seen and, uh, and state the grounds and reasons. I think the, the, the body wall video is, is a transformational mm. um, piece of equipment. It, it, it has a couple of impacts that are relevant to this. What One is it does uh, change the behaviour of the person the officer is dealing with if they feel they've been recorded and the, the cameras uh, that you purchased have got a forward facing screen mm -hmm. so they can, they can see themselves. And the second thing is of course the, 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 the camera changes the behaviour of the officer as well. So um, we believe that not only um, have we got greater transparency, we, we've also got people behaving um, differently as well. So if this is a power that we're, conti we're going to continue to use, and, and my, my firm opinion is it is, mm -hmm. um, it's for government to legislate otherwise, and whilst it's on the statute book, we, we, we will use it fairly and appropriately. Then, and actually I, I need to give my officers the right training, the right equipment, um, working with you, the right accountability, but the, the thing, the, the most important thing about this is, is visibility, transparency and scrutiny. Um, because uh, my officers very significantly are working hard to try and keep their communities safe. And I, I want to see, I want our communities to be able to see that. And not only do I want, I need them to have trust and confidence in our ability yeah. to do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So just moving on finally to vehicle crime. So this, I'm particularly um, interested in the theft of tools in the back of, of vans because we yeah. have had a, a spate of, of those because it not only affects the individual, it affects the residents in the wider community and the local business community. So what, what could be done to, to be able to tackle this particular issue? So we, we record about 12,500 vehicle crimes a year, so it is, it, this is a lot. Mm -hmm. um, most of those crimes will be reported on the phone and we have people that we would call desktop investigators that will make inquiries on the phone about um, whether anyone's seen anything, whether there's any CCTV, whether there's anything at the scene that we might ought to come and look at, like blood, um, uh, whether there's any other evidence. And we'll make a decision about, about the degree of follow-up. So, so they're, they're all scrutinised. Nothing is screened out at source just because it's a vehicle crime. And uh, if we have intelligence or information about where those stolen goods are, then we will get all over it, but I, I, that, that would be my wish to do that, especially where we've got trackable assets, which sometimes okay. technology gives us that now. In terms of what, what people can do, um, uh, people have a, have a right to be able to go about their lives um, not expecting to be victims of crime, so I'm not saying that I want people to live their lives in fear, but they, they can help us if, where possible, they don't leave valuables in the car, and they do lock the car, they leave it in a well-lit um, position where there's natural surveillance, 
Um, if, if you're parking, you know, and you drive a, any sort of car, hatchback or, or a saloon or a van, if you're reversing, not only is that a better way of parking, you're much less likely to get a car broken into. Mm -hmm. There's some evidence based around that. So there are, there are things that um, people can do to help reduce the likelihood of themselves being victims. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. So that's all we've got time for today. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Uh, I, just to thank the, the, the public who um, ring us up, give us information, um, help us with our investigations, are prepared to put the trust in us when they've been victimised um, to talk to us. Um, we're, we're here to serve you. And I'm obviously incredibly grateful to have your trust and confidence. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Constable. So today we asked the questions that you asked me to, to, to put to the Chief Constable. And, and I hope that you found them interesting. I certainly did. So our next web chat will be July the 4th. So if you've got any questions that you want me to raise with the Chief Constable, please let me know. But always remember that I'm your Police and Crime Commissioner. So I, I need to hear from you about the things that are concerning you. So please contact me. And until next time, thank you. Bye-bye.